Hey, deserving listeners, it's time to watch the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. Let's watch. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Let's watch. I was born in Kentucky, and um, then we moved, in which we moved around quite a lot when I was a kid. So you were always just, my mom had this, uh, her feet were on fire and she had to move. You know? So we moved constantly. So you were always the new kid, and that wasn't ever particularly pleasant. Then we moved to Florida. All right, so I'm actually speeding it up a little bit because he talks pretty slow. And by the way, if you ever listen to me on YouTube and you want to speed me up, uh, do so. Because if you don't know, there's, you know, there's a speed setting where you can increase the speed. I don't apologize for speaking slowly, mostly because I'm speaking off the top of my head. If I, if I was giving a talk or a lecture and I was reading notes, I would expect myself to be able to speak quickly. But when I'm doing reaction videos, I'm just speaking off the top of my head. So I'm often piecing everything together as I'm talking. So that's the nature of a reaction video. Uh, I have a lot of slow talkers in my family, including myself, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he talked for a while about why he is initiating this case. He's talking about his kids and about he's obsessed with the truth. And it was pretty awful when, according to him, Amber Heard's lies became fact to everyone in the world, including maybe people around him. It has harmed him in terms of his acting career. If his account is true, yeah, that'd be awful, right? That you are being abused for many years and then you just finally have had enough and then you leave the person and it's hard and it's sad and you're embarrassed and you have a lot of pain and maybe relational trauma regarding that you're like what was wrong with me it wasn't my fault should i ever date again and then this this allegation comes out and suddenly the, you know the world is like oh johnny depp is one of those people we all hate him, we're never gonna work with him again, and it paints his entire career. And yeah, that would just be awful, right? And you think, well, okay, just slink off into obscurity, but for a lot of people, their career is their life. Um, for me, it's that way. To have all of that just erased because someone lied about you, meaning that your legacy and your work and how hard you worked, how hard you worked to build a career and to entertain people and to just have all that just erased off the face of the planet because one person lied and you were the actual victim in the situation would be pretty awful. And so now he's talking about growing up and he was born in Kentucky, I believe, or he lived in Kentucky and they moved to Florida. He said that his mom had uh, her feet were on fire and she was always on the move. We also hear that it was hard for him to move from you know community to community, from school to school. And yeah, absolutely. I've, I've treated clients who their primary, in fact, sometimes their sole trauma was moving from school to school. It can be awful. It can be fine, depending, but it can also be awful. I never had to go through that. I grew up in the same house from the time I was two years old until I moved out when I went to college at 18. And it's just near Seattle, it's just outside Seattle. So, And I've always lived within the span of 15 mile radius. <laughs> when I say that out loud, it sounds kind of weird, maybe 25 miles or something. So I've never lived outside of Seattle and, and just outside Seattle. So I, I never went through this so I, I can't relate, but I can't imagine what it would feel like. And I've worked with clients and heard their experience and the, you know, the experience of going to a new school, no one knows you, and typically you might be a target for bullies or at the very least ostracization. And then boom, you're ripped out of that school just as you make a friend and you have that attachment loss. And that's something that I think people don't appreciate is that for children, they build attachments, obviously, right? And sometimes they're more formative than if we had a relationship as an adult. Our relationships when, when we're young are very important to us and will, depending on how they go, really affect our personality long term. And to have a, a friend at school that you bond with and then to be ripped away from that person, even though you know that friend didn't reject you and it was just circumstance that pulled you away, deep down it can feel like an abandonment. It can give you a syndrome of I'm not worthy. And especially when you go to a new school and you're trying to fit in, there's probably, you know, often a, a span of time there where you just feel, even though you know, well, you know, everyone else has their friends and all the clicks and stuff and uh, it'll take me a while to make friends. You might understand that intellectually, but deep down in your heart, you just feel like no one likes me. I'm worthless. I'm a stupid person or whatever. And with 
a lot of those experiences, you internalize those, you start to hate yourself, you start to suffer. So I don't know if Johnny Depp is talking about that. South Florida when I was about seven or eight. And again, moved several, several times. But um, my mother was quite unpredictable. She was very unpredictable. Um, she was a, she had the ability to be as, as cruel as anyone can be with all of us. Uh, that is to say, my sister Christy and my, my brother Danny and my sister Debbie. Okay, so he's saying that his mom was cruel with people and, and all the kids, which is, that's got to hurt, right? That's, I feel bad for him. And it reminds me of so many clients, kids, teens, adults who have been through that. It reminds me of a family. I, I always I, there's certain when you're a therapist, there are certain clients that are touchstones in your mind usually. And there's a family I treated many many years ago where uh, the mom was like this, and there were there were a number of kids in the family, and it was really hard for everyone to deal with, with her. And I tried to do my best, but I detected fairly quickly that she had a personality disorder. She had narcissistic personality disorder, and that wasn't going to change anytime soon. And she wasn't asking me really for help with her own personality, so I had to you know very carefully try to influence her to look at her personality so that she might start asking me for help with things. Because, you know, there's a misconception about therapy that when people come into a therapy office, the, the, the therapist does something to the client. And that's not a accurate depiction. Clients ask therapists to do things to them. So we don't do things to clients without them asking us. So I could, you know, I might see someone in my office who has a, a big problem and is verbally abusive to their family. But unless that person admits they have a problem or at least questions that they have a problem and ask me to help with that, then I can only try to convince them that they have a problem. I can only try to convince them to get help for it from me or from whoever. So it was, I mean, it's more complicated than that, but it was hard. And I, I did lay the groundwork with her, but in family therapy, you don't have a lot of concentrated time with individuals usually. And so I didn't get much done, but I was able to talk with the kids individually or away from the parents and talk with them about how they can protect themselves psychologically, emotionally from their mother. And I would never say things like, well, you know, your mom has a personality disorder, so I would never say that because I, I worried that, you know, they would go home and say, well, you know, Kirk says you have a personality disorder, so lay off, and then I would lose the family, so that wouldn't do anyone any good because the parents could pull all the kids out of therapy. If I mean, not technically, but usually practically, that's that's the, I mean, once you're 13 in Washington State, you can find your own therapist and be confidential even to your parents, but, but usually if I have a massive rupture with the parents in a situation like that, I'll, I'll never see any of them again. So that wouldn't help. But And plus, I'd have to lecture about what narcissistic personality disorder was. But I'm talking to the, the kids, and I would elicit their experience. I would show empathy for them. There's different approaches to that, right? That if a kid is a little distorted, they're a little rebellious, then you might have a different re- a different approach. You know, you think, well, I think the parents are fine. I think this kid is just kind of going through something or it's not as bad as the kid is is painting it. You know, there's a there's an approach to that. I, I would never say to the kid, you're wrong, but I, I would have a Socratic method of asking questions to try to elicit some kind of reflection for themselves. But with people that I'm like, yeah, they, they're describing what I've experienced from this individual. So there's no use in trying to go down a road of exploration of distortion, the best thing I can do is go down a road of, of coping and grieving, really, surviving. The, the family that I'm thinking of, I, I did help the kids, I, I, th- I believe, and they would tell me so. And I had enough time with them as well. There was one particular kid who was scapegoated particularly by the mom. By the way, I always switch details to hide identities of clients because of confidentiality reasons, or I have permission from the individuals in question so I can talk about it. So I was talking with one of the kids and because he he was being particularly scapegoated and the mom really wanted me to fix him, so to speak, even though in the end I I didn't really see anything uh, particularly wrong with him. It was more that he would, he was the most likely person to react back to the mom. He was sort of elected by the family to be that person. And I validated him a lot for a long time. And then 
eventually I got to a point where I said to him, look, I understand how you feel and I can see why you react the way that you do. And I'm doing my best to try to change things with your mom, but it might not change soon enough or rapidly enough. So how are you going to cope with it until you're able to move out? You know, how do you want to approach this? And over time, he eventually shifted from a combative stance to one of survival and one of differentiation, meaning that, oh, this is my mom's issue. It's not mine. She's reacting against me. And I don't need to do anything about it other than just to, uh, you know, I'll protect myself, but I won't get engaged. I won't get entangled in a fight with her because there's no point. And we fully explored that and discovered that together in our conversation. So what Johnny Depp is talking about is, I mean, it kind of sounds at least in that category, right? Which is, yeah, it's, it la- that, that trauma lasts a lifetime. You know, because our parents, we deserve parents who love us and are not abusive and listen to our feelings and care and pay attention to us within reason. Try at least not to harm us. Apologize if they make a mistake. And it sounds like Johnny Depp was far from that. Adam, also my father. <clears throat> so, um, essentially, um, she was, uh, she could become quite violent. And she was quite violent, and she was quite cruel, and she, and though there was physical abuse, certainly, um, which could be in the form of uh, an ashtray being flung at you, you know, it hits you in the head, or you get beat with a high heel. Okay, so he's talking about the mom being violent, and he laughs a little bit when he describes a, an ashtray being flung at him. And it sounds like it was often and frequent. And the the laugh, what does that mean? I don't know. But the first thought I had was, because we previously heard testimony from other people saying that Amber Heard would throw things at him. So maybe that was a little like, well, that's funny. That's ironic that, you know, there's a similarity there. Or another possibility is that when we go through difficulty, we will sometimes cope with it. And I think it's perfectly healthy to do this until we have the safety and the time to heal, to transform the pain into laughter, to make a joke about it, even though deep down there's really nothing to laugh about. So I don't know if that's what we're hearing. Shoe or a telephone or whatever's handy. So in our house, there was no, we were never exposed to any type of safety um, or security, the only thing that one could do, really, was to try to stay out of the line of fire. I started to be able to observe. I could see, I could start to see when she was about to head into a a situation where she was going to get riled up and somebody was going to get it. All right, so there are many different ways of coping with difficulties as a child, specifically violence and abuse from one's mother, uh, one of which is what Johnny Depp is describing. It's, it's common, but it's not universal by any means. There are other ways. You, you can escape in other manners. You can fight back. You could be elected by the family to uh, speak up and or to be a lightning rod for the abuse. Some, some of you might have been that person or you might have had a sibling like that that would step forward and take the abuse so that the other kids wouldn't have to. It's, you know, it's really quite tragic. And there, often, there will often be these roles in a family, particularly if there's more than one kid. And for him, his role was to become invisible and to escape to be hypervigilant and very noticing of her emotional state. And you'll almost always hear at least that coping mechanism. Like if you are in the stock market and you invested all of your life savings in the stock market, you're probably going to pay attention to the stock market, right? You're going to be one of those guys with a computer and that, you know, graph that's going out, you know, all over the place all day long. And you are waiting until the market looks just right to trade or to pull out or whatever. In the situation, it's the same, right? It's it's very critical that you pay attention, that you have 50% of your attention at all times on the mood and the, and the life of where mom is at. All the while you're ignoring yourself, you're ignoring your needs, you're being sacrificed on the altar of a parent's anger and rage and their own traumas, by the way. So 
he's saying that. And that, of course, fits with the narrative that the Johnny Depp team is posing that was recreated with Amber Heard and that he was always trying to get away and she was always the one pursuing. Um, generally, uh, it was me. Oh, he, he said, generally, the person that was being physically abused was him. So it wasn't evenly split throughout the kids. He's saying he was the primary target. How could she be cruel? The, well, the various categories, I suppose, are there are there's, there's physical violence, of course, there's physical abuse, to which she was, um, that was a constant. That was just a constant, you know. We were all somewhat shell-shocked, you know. Even if she just walked past us, you'd, you'd, you'd sort of shield yourself. Yeah, oh, that's... That is awful and sounds believable. He sounds credible. He sounds um, like he's speaking the truth. And yeah, that is just rough. The reason why I say it sounds like he's telling the truth because, you know, eventually I'm going to get to the Amber Heard testimony and I'm going to be looking for signs of deception. Of course, I can't detect lies and do not believe people on the internet, YouTube included, that claim they can look at body language and know if someone is telling the truth or not. There's no such thing as a body language expert. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, in the field of psychology, we have been looking at such things for over 100 years, and we've been looking at eye movements, and there is so much pseudoscience and bullcrap on the internet and on TikTok and all those places. So um, I'm not saying anything along those lines, but we can make some guesses. We can never know, of course, and there's no way uh, to be able to, to, you know, it's pretty easy to test, right? So you get one of those body language experts. They're essentially like psychics, essentially, right? Because And they make all these claims, but you get a, a body language expert into a room and you give them a bunch of test subjects and you instruct a bunch of people to lie and you instruct a bunch of people to tell the truth and the body language expert cannot tell the difference in general or it's a flip of the coin essentially so uh, or it's barely off of a flip of a coin meaning that they can tell the liar 51 percent of the time as opposed to 50 percent of the time something like that anyway there's there's just a you know mountains and mountains of studies along those lines looking at it from various different angles eye movement all that stuff and there is some science around that, around eye movement and body language, but there's no way that you could look at someone, particularly when they're in a situation like this, and be able to conclude one way or the other. Like when Amber Heard eventually gets on the stand, I think, you know, I've been seeing clips on Reddit and stuff, people saying, oh, look at this, she's lying. And okay, maybe, absolutely. And when we get there, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on it. But when people are on the stand, it's a high stress situation, right? You are... Imagine five, seven years later going on into court and you know millions upon millions of people are going to watch this uh, footage and you have to convince everyone of even something that is true. And you can imagine that if you're not particularly good at acting, <laughs> then you might uh, you know, come across as if you're lying. Anyway, so... Uh, but I will say that I've listened to a lot of people as they tell me stories that has a potential deception to it. Like if, if there's a couple and they both remember something different about a previous conflict that they had been in, there are certain cues that I look for in terms of either deceiving me or even themselves. Uh, I can never know, of course. But anyway, the other thing I'll say is, again, he laughed. He said, you know, he pantomime something that is really quite horrific. I mean, imagine that you're a child and your mom comes around the corner and you you have this involuntary protection reaction. That means that violence was random. It was frequent. It was hurtful. And he laughs about it. So uh, I'm guessing that's because it's so painful to do otherwise. Because you didn't know what was going to happen. So there was, there was the physical abuse, which was, was a, a constant there was uh, quite a lot of verbal abuse. There was quite a lot of name calling and bullying. You know, m making fun of making fun of whatever defect you know w one might have. You know, if my brother wore glasses, so of course he was four eyes, or, and he had his teeth were messed up in the front, so he was buck tooth as well. And wow, yeah, I've heard this before. I don't often see it in my office in terms of the perpetrator. I'll, I'll hear from victims about this. Just imagine that, just a, a general attitude or behavior from a mother that is frequently ridiculing and makes up nicknames for one's kids that are 
designed to make fun of them and make them feel bad about themselves. I mean, wow. She was down to, like, she lived on the couch and she weighed about 70 pounds. All that imagery spun into my head at that time that I thought that was a very, in my head at the time, I thought that that was a cowardly way for my father to have left. All right, so to catch you up, he talked about how his father had had enough of the abuse and Johnny Depp seems to think that his father was a good person. And the father left and told Johnny that you're the man of the house now. And it sounds so strange that someone would say something like that, right? But I've heard a number of accounts like this where the father is fed up or whatever and goes to the the oldest boy or, and I don't think he was, I don't think Johnny was the oldest boy, but I don't know, one of the children and just says, okay, you're now the in the role of being a parent. And not only are you losing your father, but you're being foisted this role that you don't want. And you're essentially saying, wait, I have to deal with my mom even more now. Everything's my fault. Everything's my responsibility. So that's pretty awful. And, you know, I don't know what the dad was supposed to do in a situation like that. Well, if abuse was happening, he should have called the authorities, right? Now, a lot of times what people will worry, and maybe I should say this, and I can't speak for all governmental agencies around the United States, but I can speak about the agencies in Seattle, and that is, is that when you call CPS, even if, so let's say that a father, the father came to me and said, you know, what, what do I do? I'd say, call, call Child Protective Services because your children are being abused <clears throat> and they need oversight. And and then the father says, well, but I don't want my kids being put in foster care. And I would say, well, if your wife works with everyone on recovery and on not being abusive, then they aren't likely to take the kids away, or at least for not very long. And uh, don't we want the situation to be better? Well, Child Protective Services is interested in that. They're not interested in taking children away. They're interested in protecting children from abuse. And also, as a secondary goal, is to retain family relationships. Also, another goal is to not cost the government and the taxpayer money. And there's only a limited amount of funds to pay for foster care. Uh, the government, even if they wanted to rip children away from parents whenever they're called, they couldn't do that. Uh, also, there's a legal aspect to that. You can take Child Protective Services to court on these kinds of things, and sometimes judges will side with the with the family against Child Protective Services. But anyway, point is, is that I would say to the father, well, there's a version of the future in which you stay in daily contact with your kids. Maybe divorce happens, but you're able to be there with them, <clears throat> to protect them, and you might even get to a situation where your wife gets treatment, gets the trauma treatment she needs or the, the parenting help that she needs or something. And the kids will have a constant social worker that they can reach out to whenever they're being abused. So we could be on the recovery side of things, but you have to stay in contact with family and you have to call the authorities, you know. Now, if I was a therapist, I would, I would have to call the authorities myself because I'm a mandated reporter along those lines. But I often will really try to convince the people who told me to call Child Protective Services uh, instead of me, not because I don't want to do it, but because Child Protective Services often will ask me, well, what what do you know? And I'll say, well, this other person was the one who told me, and it's much you know stronger information if it would come from him, right? So, and uh, another aspect of that, just while I'm on the subject, is that if I called Child Protective Services and I didn't tell the father I was doing that, I was going to do that, the authorities could come after both parents and then the father, if he came to me, would feel like I betrayed him. So usually I'm trying to work with people and uh, when I can. Um, I've even had abusers call CPS on themselves. You know, I, I had a client once who disclosed some things and I said, what did you just tell me? And, and he told me more and I, and I said, so you understand that's abuse, right? And he's like, well, I don't know. And I said, and remember a couple of weeks ago when I told you verbally and I had you sign that thing indicating that I had to report to the government when I hear evidence of or indications of child abuse? Do you remember that? And he's like, well, yeah. And I, and I said, well, you just told me something that was abusive and I don't have any choice here. I, there, there's no, There's no option. 
even if I wanted to not report this, I couldn't do that. There's, I, I could lose my license, I could be sanctioned, I could be sued. So I, I can't do that. I, I, I have to report this. So we had a long conversation. He was very upset. He was crying. He was angry. And he was, he hated me. And I wasn't entirely feeling safe the entire time. Well, I, I wondered if things would escalate. I, I never felt unsafe. But he eventually, after actually a number of hours, came around to accepting what was going to happen. And I, I was trying to tell him, look, if you work with the government, they will work with you too. You know, there are a lot of people who make mistakes as parents. And if you take responsibility for it and you ask them for help and, and you comply with their recommendations, then the the consequences to you could actually be quite minimal, if if nothing at all. I was involved in a lot of cases like that. Again, because the government is not interested in ripping kids away, they understand that that could actually do more harm than good, potentially, or at the very least, let's try to salvage the relationship while you know completely excising any of the abuse. Anyway, and then um, I eventually convinced him to call Child Protective Services himself. And, you know, he was not willing I mean, at first, but I said, you understand that I'm going to have to do it. So this is happening. If you call, it'll make you look a little better. And so it took a while from there. And, and eventually he called. It was not easy for him. You know, it was a big shock to him, but in the end, it was a good thing. And he saw through it that he was able to really face his behavior and his issues and his trauma. And in the end, he thanked me for it. I mean, I don't think he was like 100% thankful of it, but I think he saw that it was a good thing that he was able to be confronted to face his issues and to really look at his behavior. So that would be something that Johnny's father could have done. But again, this is in the 70s, I'm guessing, and who knows what was going on in Florida or Kentucky. And of course, a lot of families don't know uh, the options. And yeah, it's just unfortunate that Johnny went through that. And then he talks about how his mother became very depressed. So that points in the direction of massive attachment traumas that the mother went through and had reactivity to attachment threats, which can often look like abuse or will take the form of abuse and verbal abuse in the same way that I've hypothesized that if Amber Heard is abusive and borderline and histrionic, then it would be a very similar conceptualization. Then the father leaves and she falls into depression, according to Johnny Depp, and then tried to kill herself and almost did, attempted, and then uh, people intervened. They rushed her to the hospital, saved her life. And then she fell more and more into, de into depression, stopped eating, and became quite frail very quickly. So this is more evidence that his mom suffers from a, suffered from a personality disorder, massive attachment, uh, difficulties, and traumas. And the, the, on the surface, what you saw was the abuse, the violence, the insults, but underneath it all was deep, deep pain. It doesn't justify the behavior, but it does provide a conceptualization of it. And of course, we know that we end up recreating our past difficult relationships in the present without a lot of awareness and a lot of healing and a lot of therapy. And perhaps that's what Johnny Depp did. Mr. Depp, how did you feel about your father when he left? I was very disappointed in him because I started to believe that his exit was... was Sneaky, cowardly. Yeah, that's not uncommon. And you could argue that it's an accurate uh, label for what the father did, but it's hard to know what the father was going through. At the very least, for Johnny Depp, it was painful for him, and he felt abandoned not only by the father in all likelihood, but also left to the monster, you know, left alone, left behind. And you could imagine Johnny being very angry about that. When he said goodbye to me, when he left for work that morning, he said goodbye, you know, goodbye, Bob. No, see you later, Pop. That was it. Until um, I learned the truth from uh, from it. Mr. Depp, what have you learned from um, your experience in your childhood and observing your father in your childhood? I learned that I was wrong about my first impressions of his his exit from the family. Um, very wrong. Interesting. I think he's saying I've learned according to Johnny Depp's narrative, that I now know what it feels like to be married to someone like that. 
and it is not a cowardly act to leave. Now, as I was saying earlier, perhaps the father should have done more to protect the kids, uh, fight for the kids. Now it's the 70s. What's the chance that in a divorce the father is going to get uh, sole custody? It would, you know, it's it's a hard thing to prove. Even if you do have data to support abuse from one of the parents, um, you know, sometimes for sure, but it's hard because at least in my experience in family court, it's hard to get the government to take away a parent's right to their own children. Now, there are cases where one of the parents will get very little custody, but at least they have, you know, a couple weekends a month alone with the kids. But another thing that I wonder for Johnny, if all this is true, which we don't know, is that if he concluded that his father was a coward and he was really angry at his father for leaving, then, and that could really burn inside of you for a long time. And you can become really quite rigid in your opinions and your approaches to life to avoid being the way you perceived your father to be, then you engage with someone like Amber. You could imagine Johnny Depp staying in the relationship even longer than he would have otherwise because he's trying to avoid doing what his father did. I'll tell you one thing that I learned that was, that was uh, one of the best lessons I believe I've ever learned in my life, ever could learn in, your life, in my life, was um, based on my experiences as a, as a child and what I'd seen and experienced, I knew exactly how to raise children. Um, when when uh, when my girl Vanessa got pregnant, um, I knew exactly how to raise children, which was to do the opposite of what they did, of what Betty Sue did. Yeah, I don't know about Johnny's parenting style, but I will say that there are two general reactions to going through something like that when you start parenting your own kids. One is to do similar things to what your what your parents did to you but maybe morph it a little bit so it doesn't look the same to you but it is the same like you know he went through physical abuse and so he might become very verbally abusive to or a parent in his position might become very verbally abusive but not physically or very rageful and not physical with the kids and although the kids are terrified of you you can sleep well at night saying well you know i didn't hit them the way my mom did so that's one path that is unfortunate. Another path is to overcompensate and to become so passive as a parent that you harm your kids in a different way, maybe to to a lesser extent, but you're still harming your kids. Now, I don't know, maybe he did manage to not engage in that kind of behavior or anything close to it, but it's hard to escape. You parents out there who went through difficulties as a child, it's really hard to not engage, especially when you're stressed out, you know, because when you're a parent, there's there's a lot of ins and outs, you know, it's, it's, it's all day long, it's 24 <laughs> seven. And you're a parent when you're in a good mood and you're a parent when you're in your worst mood. And it, it all comes down to, you know, those bad mood moments. And it's hard not to do what we saw. And it's hard not to do what we saw and convince ourselves that it's the right thing to do. It becomes a very knee-jerk reaction. And that's okay. We just have to reflect on that and make plans to avoid that in the future. But the problem is, is most people don't do that. They just either ignore it or go into denial or they justify it or something. And, uh, you know, but I I don't know. When I hear Johnny Depp say that, I, I, I wonder how his parenting style actually played out you know because it's hard to to not do something but i don't know maybe and i have known people who show particular resilience having gone through horrific childhoods and absolutely manage to you know hit it out of the park when it comes to parenting all right well that does it for that episode everyone out there please take care of yourself because you deserve it you really really do